Welcome, everybody, and I'm really happy you're here with us today. Uh, today is really a fun topic from my perspective anyway. I mean, it lets my inner geek come out. We're going to be talking about smart data and uh, smarter AI. Uh, so over the last uh, last few months, we've had several webinars. You know, we started with the future of uh, future of data clouds uh, and kind of set set the groundwork for a lot of topics where we will be talking about over the course of these knowledge bursts. Um, the next one was security. Security is a hot topic and very important and really permeates everything that we have to do from a technology perspective and data sharing perspective. Um, and last month, Amber uh, did a wonderful job of, of really communicating what we mean by smart and trusted data. Uh, it's a wonderful webinar. I uh, really highly recommend if you haven't seen it, go back and watch that one. It's pretty foundational for what we do here at Burst IQ. And today I have uh, our CTO, Tyson Henry. He's going to join me. We're going to tag team this presentation. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about, again, review a bit of the definition of what AI is um, and some of the various disciplines of AI. Uh, Tyson's going to walk, uh, walk you through a, a bit of history on kind of the data science behind AI and some other really relevant topics in terms of learning and learning algorithms. We'll hit a few use cases, and then at the back, we'll talk about some of the challenges uh, really facing broader adoption of AI. Uh, say hi to everyone, Tyson, and um, turn it over to you for just a minute or two. Sure. Hey, everyone. I'm glad you're here and joining us, and, and I agree with Frank. This is the... can hear you, this is the, So I'm here now. Um, apparently, I just got a... No one can hear me. I got you. I think oh, okay. Technical issues on my side. I need AI to help me with my uh, with speaker volume. How's that? Uh, okay, I'll work on that this afternoon when I get off this call. <laughs> well, hey everyone, glad you're here. And, and Frank's right. This is the this is a fun topic. This is uh, where we get to geek out a little bit and talk about uh, data and AI, which is um, kind of where I spent a lot of my career. And uh, the data gonk part is is where we get to have some fun and talk about how Burst IQ leverages different things with AI and how we're applying it to our life graph technology and our blockchain. So uh, really glad to be here, Frank, and uh, let's get the show rolling. All right, let's have a little fun. Uh, let me share the presentation and we're, we're gonna get going. Okay, off we go, T, let me know, let me make sure uh, you can see that, give me a thumbs up. Great. Um, Right, first up, first up on the list, uh, we're gonna talk about what, what is AI? So AI itself is really kind of this, this whole big topic. It's an umbrella discipline that covers everything related to making machines smarter. Um, and you know, the, it, there's a, a, just a number of disciplines in this broader, this broader topic of AI. We're gonna hit a number of them all the way from kind of edge-based edge AI uh, all the way all the way back to kind of deep learning and, and what it means to do that. So again, AI fundamentally make machines smarter, allow them to learn over time. Um, machine learning and deep uh, in reference to this term called deep learning is really machine learning applied to large data sets. But again, we're gonna talk a little bit about this notion of edge, edge and micro, uh, micro AIs and how you kind of combine those things into one, uh, one broader system. AI definitions. This is this is a this is a bit of review for us. Um, this was in the first kind of kind of the history of data clouds. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, artificial neural intelligence, and this again, this is what we experience the most today. If we're interacting with the chat bot, if we're interacting with uh, uh, Alexa or Google um, in terms of voice interaction, we're actually interacting with a with an AI that's that's uh, been trained to deal with conversational language and parse that conversational language to go execute a specific task. Uh, I would even classify some of the uh, self-driving machines in this notion of uh, narrow intelligence because they're designed for a specific purpose um, and, and really, really drive deep in that, that purpose of knowledge and learning and understanding. Um, next up is collaborative intelligence. And this is one of my favorites. This is where I think uh, at least within healthcare, we're going to start seeing this really emerge and evolve at a pretty rapid place. And what is what is collaborative intelligence? It's the combination of man machine. So it's it's a person, um, a man or a woman. It's a person interacting 
with a with a narrow intelligence to perform a specific task. You know, a good example um, within within health is image analysis. Uh, for instance, uh, radiology imaging in terms of pointing out what may be issues within it within an image and letting the person interact and determine if that that in fact is the case. Um, additionally, you're seeing a lot of these predictive networks emerge where where it's it's a combination of a lot of people and a lot of machines focused on a very specific topic and and really running through some algorithms from a predictive perspective. So a lot of potential in the near term for collaborative intelligence. Um, next is artificial general intelligence. Um, and what what we're going to see here is that you know this is this is what people talk about the singularity where um, machine intelligence really starts to equate to human intelligence, at, at least from a computational perspective. We still have this whole whole dimension of emotions and feelings and 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 some of the abstraction that machines still have a very very difficult time uh, comprehending. But from the standpoint of processing and producing uh, and and really count, computing a large amounts of data for uh, a more general basis, um, lots of movement here in the space, lots of research here in the space. Uh, lots of conversations here in the space. And I'm going to talk about swarm intelligence in just a minute. But what, what I think you're going to see kind of near term is the combination of multiple aspects of narrow intelligence, each focusing on a specific thing, working together that's going to give us the illusion of, uh, of an artificial general intelligence. And finally, we're talking about artificial uh, superintelligence, where the machine side of life actually exceed um, our ability as humans, not only to process data, but in, in lots of aspects and lots of ethical issues uh, arise in, in these last two categories. We're gonna talk about those as we get through, um, get through the webinar. Swarm intelligence, I wanna hit this because this, this is something, as I mentioned in the, in the future of data clouds, very close to my heart. It's, it's been an area that I spent a lot of time in my career focused on. And you know the best analogy in terms of the basic definition of swarm intelligence is what you see in insect behavior, bees, ants, uh, and even flocks of birds and, and schools of fish in terms of, you know, their relative each unit within, within the swarm has roughly the same amount of intelligence, but they have a way to work together that, that gives the illusion of a broader intelligence. And I think this concept, this concept of special purpose things or uh, individuals, be it uh, thousands or millions working together Will, will give us not only the illusion, but the, the notion of real intelligence as they work together. And at the core still, re, still requires something to orchestrate and coordinate, uh, coordinate between all these various participants uh, within a swarm. Um, so again, it's one of the things that are foundational for us at Burst IQ. You're gonna see a lot more about this topic in terms of real life applications as, as we go throughout the year. Neural networks, um, again, big topics is one of these broader terms like artificial intelligence. Neural networks is, is really a technique and how you process and understand data in, a, in an attempt to do it the way we as humans uh, and uh, do and the way our brain works in, in building these connections. There's been some inherent limitations to neural networking from the standpoint of what it takes to build them and the computational resources it takes to build them. Uh, but more, Moore's Law is catching up, quantum computing starting to emerge. Well, you, well, you see this aspect and this discipline really start to accelerate over the next few years. So I'm gonna bring Tyson back in now. Uh, Tyson's gonna give us, uh, give us a bit of history lesson on, on, uh, on all the history of this and how we got to where we are. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Yeah, um, so you know, part of wondering at where the future lies and how we're gonna get from here to there is actually taking a little step back and looking at where we came from and, and where databases evolved from. Um, you know, IBM really put out their RAMSAC system back in 1959. Mm -hmm. um, and, and why that's kind of key for databases is that was the first random access tape drive that they built. And so the random access piece gave way to being able to randomly access data in different places rather than sequentially, which is computers had only been built for sequential access up to that point. So Dr. Todd or Cod in 1970, he's a fellow at IBM, he actually wrote the paper and was the father of the relational data model. That gave way to, and <laughs> 
Sorry, folks, a little technical difficulty. That gave way to the entire birth of what we know today as the relational database system or database management systems. SQL came out of that in, in the late 70s, uh, different languages. The standard came out in 84. During the 80s, you had the emergence of all the commercial ones, DB2, Oracle, Sybase, and Formix. Um, little tidbit, and Formix is my favorite database that I used in, early on in my professional career. Um, com personal computers then were um, actually had their own databases in the 80s. And so you see this evolution of concept into production. And during the late 80s and 90s, relational databases exploded in private businesses. I mean, the, the adoption of what it means to have a three-tier network of data, business logic, and presentation really took hold there. Then in the 90s, you start seeing some new twists on relational databases. The object-oriented database came into being in 1990, just as uh, object-oriented languages were uh, hitting their stride. Then you start seeing where the evolution today occurs. In 1998, the first reference to NoSQL by Carlo Strozzi in a paper came out. Then you start seeing the evolution of key value pair document stores, wide column databases, graph databases, um, and in 08, Neo4j, one of the front runners in the graph database technology today, um, they first, their first implementation was 08. By 2010, you see that um, all the commercial databases have consolidated. Some have gone out of business, some have um, consolidated into three, a handful of companies, and there's a couple of popular open source MySQL and Postgres being them. And then, of course, I would be remiss in saying that part of this whole big data evolution is not is the blockchain part of it that comes into play. And then 2016, Burst IQ's Burst Chain with data on blockchain emerged. So this is kind of the history of where we're going, where we've come from. And the industry has been evolving very rapidly. I mean, I know this is 50 years, but within 50 years, a lot has transpired and a lot has been learned. And then with the advance advancements of computers, like uh, Frank said, Moore's law, decade after decade, things are improving faster and faster. We are generating data in ways that we never imagined before. And so databases are going to become key and there are different tools for handling them. And we're going to jump into that in the next set of slides. So um, just as a kind of a breakdown uh, for those that are a little unfamiliar with the types of databases, um, what I was referring to when I said RDBMSs or DBMSs, I was referring to the actual table that we call, or databases that we call SQL databases. Now, SQL databases um, are very table oriented. So if you've ever opened Excel and worked on a, on a sheet on a tab at the bottom and you created multiple sheets, you're in essence working with a data, a primitive database where each sheet is a table. And you can make relationships between those tables. You can say this row refers to this row. And if you're a real Excel expert, you can make um, workbooks do some crazy and amazing things. Well, that's just like what you do in a regular RDBMS, but RDBMSs are at a much larger scale. But the idea here is that you're creating constraints by tying tables together using what's called a primary key and a foreign key as indexed to one another. And again, that works great to a certain extent, but the evolution of NoSQL is actually encompasses columnar databases, column-wide databases, key value pairs, as well as document stores. They all fall under the umbrella of NoSQL. And in fact, one of the key technologies we're gonna get into here real shortly, which is really fun, is graph databases. And depending on who you listen to, they technically fall under a NoSQL umbrella. I like to think of them as a little different. They have a very different flavor to what they do to the data than NoSQL and SQL do. Um, NoSQL doesn't, it lacks kind of that third normal form structure that most data modelers and data architects adhere to when they work with RDBMSs. And that's a good thing because now you can start exploring different types of relationships. You're not bound to the, the hard and fast of a table. Then we get into graph, and that's this is where we're going to spend a bunch of our time today. Um, graph databases aren't really focused on a table or a group of data. They really focus on what a node is, and a node you can think of as a noun, and we'll get into a little bit of this in a second, and then they're tied together by verbs or relationships. Now, this adds a whole different type of structure to data 
than a relational database does. And I'll show you on the next slide what I'm referring to. Now you can see that anybody who's um, done any kind of computer science work and understands data structures has seen a graph before. And if you haven't, I'm sure you're on Facebook or Twitter or you've seen a, a, a diagram of like a molecule or something. And you start seeing how um, atoms or cells have bindings and relationships to one another. You see how um, you get that uh, notice on LinkedIn where it says, hey, you're, you're a third relation to this other person. And if you've ever wondered how on earth do they know that Maria has a third relationship to Jim? Well, it's probably accomplished because of graph database structures. So each of these hexagons is a noun, it's a person, place, or thing, it's an entity, and an entity is referred to as a node. Now, we can give these nodes labels or categories, and in this example, you know, I, I highlighted that this node is a person. And so we have four people on this uh, graph. Their relationship to each other is how they happen to know one another. Now, this is a very simple graph, and it's also known as a directed acyclic graph because it never circles back on itself. And it also, it, it gives us the ability to ask questions of data in a context not available in RDBMS. And let me give you an example. If I have a table in the database of people and I have another table that has relationships, if I wanna see where who Anne is re, uh, related to or what she has a relationship with like two or three generations away, I have to write a kind of an inner join query back on one table three or four times in order to resolve all the possible uh, combinations of where Anna may know someone. Well, in graph database structure, I can simply ask, how does Anna know anybody two or three degrees away from myself? And that's a very, very simple uh, query for a graph database to execute. And so when you start looking at data in this context and you start putting um, relationships around data, and what I don't have on here is a more complex example where I might have medications. And now I have a, a where I can see that Tom and Maria are taking the same medication, or perhaps they see a doctor that's related to another doctor. So I can start making lots of inferences on the types of relationships that are kind of buried and hidden in traditional databases, but are very obvious and explicit in a graph database structure. And so when we get into some of the machine learning topics here a bit, you'll start seeing how graph database structures can actually aid and give us deeper insights into how machine learning can use that data versus a uh, normal database. So Frank, you wanna take us to the next one? So I started talking about this and I'm gonna give you a little bit of foreshadowing at the end of this slide because Frank's gonna talk about something that is really key to what we're trying to really do with data in today's world and especially at Burst IQ. But first of all, graph database strengths. Again, I've kind of alluded that instead of having data that you loosely couple together through IDs and primary keys and, and how do I make multi-dimensional relationships, that's really hard. Graph database does it directly and connects the data right off the bat. And so you, you get that binding immediately and you get to understand it. The thing it does though, is it allows non-DBAs and data science professionals to really use visual tools and write different queries to understand data in ways they couldn't before. And so it's the idea of narrowing the bridge between data science and data consumers. And graph databases have a lot of technologies there. We won't get into that quite today. That's a whole nother fun topic that we can explore sometime. Um, so what this whole, what all of these items do is add context to data. And context of data has value that is very hard to quantify in words for me for you right now. But when you start adding context to data, how does this data element relate to this data? And, and what are some of the other contexts of why this exists here? You start opening up all new realms within machine learning. So Frank, do you wanna take it away and talk about what I've already segued you to? Yeah, absolutely, T, thanks. Good setup.
Context. Context is hugely important in, in data, not just in graph data, uh, but uh, across the board, particularly, particularly when you're talking about health data. <clears throat> Context matters. Take this very simple statement. I never said you stole the data. Um, I could change the context of the statement just by where I put my inflection. I never said you stole the data. I never said you stole the data. I never said you stole the data. So again, each context drives a, a variation, uh, each inflection drives a variation of meaning to this one simple sentence. Uh, and so it is with data in a broader context. No pun intended. Um, so dimensions of context. You know, a lot of times in traditional uh, data data oriented systems, we're really just concerned about what is the value of a piece of data. But when you start putting in data in context, you not only have to deal with the value of the data, you have to deal with the identity of who that data belongs to or what that data represents, as well as um, spatial and temporal dimensions or time and location dimensions become very, very important. And particularly as you're collecting data over time and over a number of locations. And then finally, you know, in the context of activity and relationship, not only how data relates to other pieces of data, but maybe how an identity relates to a different community. All become very important in the notion of context and, and next generation solution sets take this into account, not just recording the value of data, but also recording both its, its attributes and its meanings within the data object itself. And again, in our last webinar, we talked about this notion of contact and we talked uh, con uh, context as well as trust. And trust, trust is also a very valid uh, and important dimension. You know, who or what created the data? How has the data been modified by whom? Um, and as well as uh, who has the rights to the data? Um, and has it been validated by a third party? I think all are very important dimensions of trust plus other, other questions. So context in terms of understanding what that data really represents and trust. Um, in terms of is it verified or, or what's the lo level of degree I could trust source and origin and actual value within the data. Uh, again, I refer you back to our last webinar. Amber spent a lot of time talking about these concepts. Uh, please go re-listen to that if you haven't already. So how it all comes together in a bigger picture. So uh, in, in reality, Edge provides context. The network provides trust. And AI provides understanding, and AI actually can provide a lot more than understanding. Um, but in for a simple simplicity perspective, kind of think about how all this stuff works together in the in 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 these dimensions: edge context, network trust, AI understanding. So I'm going to kick it back over uh, over to Tyson. He's going to walk us through uh, a number of variations of machine learning. You bet. So. Let's move on, and go right into the first slide. So when we talk about machine learning, um, there are essentially three major categories of disciplines in machine learning that we'll touch on briefly. Um, the first one is uh, the category of classification algorithms. And these are used to really take data and break it down into say buckets or classes for a given input. So this is really good for taking data with uh, lots of variables and then trying to say that this, uh, if you want to think about it, it is a stream of data or a group of attributes that make up a document or a row of data, whatever container of information you want to refer to it as, how does this, uh, how does this get classified? And one of the easiest ones to uh, start with is a decision tree. Now, most machine learning algorithms, what you do is you have what's called a training set of data. So what you do is you start off with a set of data that you know, you have already, it's already classified the way you want. And what you do is you hand that to the model and the model learns from that training set. And you there, all of these models have different ways of um, changing configuration values or changing strengths or, or values, what values you want to use as part of your decision tree or the classification algorithm as a whole, um, and, and which ones absolutely don't apply when trying to classify the data you'd like. But as you run through the training model, the machine learning algorithm learns from that training data. Then you run test data through the same thing. Now the test data 
you remove the desired output or classification, but you know what it is. And what you're doing is you're testing, did the machine learning algorithm learn from my training model or training data? Did it learn what I wanted it to do? And then from there, you can turn it free on your data and go uh, from there. Now, a decision tree, like I said, was is the kind of the easiest one to uh, think of because we kind of do it every day, whether we know it or not. Um, a decision tree is um, simply a workflow. Uh, you get presented with data and you go, is this number higher or lower? Oh, it's lower. Okay. Well, is the color blue or red? Well, it's red. Well, you just made two decisions and walked through a decision tree. And that's what machine learning does, but it does it at a deep learning level where once it's trained, I can put into it lots and lots of data and have it crunch through it very fast. And here's a good use case. So a, a medical use case that we've actually used here at Burst IQ is for chronic kidney disease. And what we did is we had this wealth of information and chronic kidney disease is, has categories or classes and it, it's one through five. Um, one being early stages, five being a, a chronic case. And each case has a set of criteria that depend on blood work, age, and a multitude of factors. Well, you can train a model to go through data um, for patients in bulk, if you will, and go through all this information and reclassify them as, as information changes about each patient, how new lab results come in, or if they've aged, or if it's been so long since their last um, dialysis, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these factors can allow a computer to go through and check on patients and move them through stages. And of course, then you can get into all sorts of things on how to alert the doctor or the hospital or whoever, if, if something has changed in that patient. Now we're, we're not spending uh, lots and lots of uh, healthcare provider time going through each patient record, trying to understand uh, where they're at. So there's a very, very real use case with classification algorithms when it comes to something like that. Okay, category two. Um, when we're now we're moving into a little more different types of uh, approaches, and one of the things that I'll stop and talk about real quickly is, you know, machine learning isn't a black box. You can't dump a bunch of data into it and say, "I want this." turn a crank and get it. There is a lot of data science and data understanding and data knowledge that has to come into play as you use these different algorithms because I have to understand, do I have a multi-variable input and I'm looking for a single output? Is my data more organized in a collinear fashion or is it more random? Do I have one input that affects one output? And then what kind of result am I looking for? And all of these come into play on which category you pick. And then you also within each category, which technique is the best for you. So this is where I can, now, if you wanna think of it this way, linear regression is probably the easiest one to understand on this page, but it'll give you an, uh, a basis for how regression algorithms work. If you think of a simple X and Y graph, and you put a dot on the graph, you've essentially put a dot at two locations, an X and a Y value. Well, let's say you have a thousand of those. There is a way to train the model such that each input along the X has a predicted value along the Y, and there is a line that, uh, that goes through this group of data points so that the next time you introduce a new X, it can calculate what its predicted Y should be. And again, depending on the data and depending on your outcome, this might be a very good regression algorithm to work, or it may not be. And this is partly where you get into lots of having to understand the, the math and the formula behind these. But once you pick one and you train the model, the repeatability of the results is very impressive, which is why there's so much work that goes into the front part of data science and machine learning. But once it's trained, you can really get a lot of use and very rapid use out of these models. So we'll go into category three and move along here, clustering. Now, clustering is a I'll, I'll tell you, is, is the most um, fun and most interesting of the three algorithms to me, um, because this is one that has an unsupervised learning aspect to it. And this is where if you have data that has multivariables, doesn't have a linear function to it, 
and you know you're looking for how different data and points belong together. Now, if you start thinking about where I'm going with this and start thinking about graph databases and how data is organized, there is a natural clustering of information when it comes to graph databases. So how can we train clustering algorithm, algorithms to take the inherent data and context from a graph model, for instance, and apply different clustering algorithms to it? So um, the best analogy I can give for you, this is if you have a bunch of random dots on a page, and then you start looking for um, patterns where um, different, uh, different dots are spaced different distances from each other, there then becomes a, a grouping that a, a, a appears. I'm sorry. Um, you begin to identify what's called feature sets or feature points within the group of data. And then these different types of algorithms here, there's four listed here. The K-means is probably the most used uh, to start with. And that will then give you the idea of this group of data belongs together, this group of data belongs together. So when new data is introduced, I can identify that belongs with this group. This belongs to say category one of a chronic kidney disease grouping or, or stage three or stage three B, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these different types of categories really apply um, and work very well depending on your use case. And so at Burst IQ, part of our data pipeline and part of what we're doing with the platform around life graphs is beginning to understand relationships that may or may not quite be apparent to the user, but they're in the data. And these types of algorithms, clustering and regression will give us insights into how data is related to each other in ways we didn't see before. So we'll move on from here. So I already talked about this a little bit, but let me dive into a little bit more. Um, as I alluded to, graphs are a natural representation of things we see every day. Um, I already talked about social graphs, where they exist in uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, um, how different, how our brain networks are wired to be used, um, hierarchical imaging clustering. So um, a project I've worked on in the past um, at a previous company for doing Department of Defense work was doing image recognition and was actually doing clustering around feature sets on an image in order to identify moving parts from one image to the next. And it's a very, very interesting field of study because it starts training computers on how to recognize images. And that's where you start seeing things on, on the web where I can put up a picture and it'll predict, oh, this is a person, this is a car, this is a bridge. And so that's all because of clustering and feature set analysis and images. And it's a really fascinating field to study. Um, let's talk about contextual um, data again, because that's really what adds another set of value to data. So as we all know, they've talked about data being the new oil, the new petroleum, it's got inherent value. Um, context just adds to that value set and opens up a new doorway for us. Now, finally, I like this quote um, by Jim Weber. Uh, Neo Technology is actually the company that makes Neo4j, that graph database I referred to before. And machine learning doesn't depend on graph databases in order to work. You can use uh, machine learning with all sorts of data input. But there's a, a basic efficiency of how storage and traversal of information within a graph is beneficial to machine learning. So at the end of the day, graphs can be inputs into machine learning, but it can also be a natural output of machine learning. And so uh, my personal belief is you're going to see graph databases become out of its little niche pocket of where it exists in data science today, and it's going to grow rapidly. And I think there's going to be new types of machine learning evolved around this aspect of how graph databases can be used uh, to unlock different types of insights. So at this point, um, I'm going to pull Frank back in because we get to talk about some use cases. Frank. Yeah, as long as I can, as long as I can click without giving everybody, um, you know, making everybody's stomach. I'm not sure if you should drive. <laughs> <laughs> you have to back off a little bit of this. That's for yeah. sure. You got to stop um, drinking so much coffee. <laughs> too many buttons to push. 
you know, okay, AI and health systems sample use cases. Uh, I, I think you can see these things really start clustering together around what would be more deep deep learning type applications versus edge edge intelligence. So over on the right, research, you know, a lot of lot of uh, AI being employed, particularly in the pharma space, around gene editing and research, uh, genomics, proteomics, uh, cellular biomarkers drug discovery and how they how drugs interact with us as individuals, uh, drug effectiveness, and, and of course, broader population health. So you saw a lot, of, a lot of real data science go into the generation of a lot of, of the COVID vaccines uh, and really being able to get those in the market a bit faster versus, you know, traditional methods uh, uh, that were employed in the past. Um, over on the on the left side, person care, this is where you start seeing more um, more edge intelligence begin to emerge in, in the form of wellness and early detection. Uh, I love a lot of the science around early detection that's not only looking at data uh, about you as a person, but also uh, also able to look at how you're moving and your motions and, and even, uh, even emotions uh, to determine kind of early indicators and in the onset of, the, uh, of certain diseases. Um, obviously, patient engagement uh, being used quite extensively now in the form of, again, chatbots and outreach and uh, adherence reminders is all kind of lumped in these categories. Um, we're going to see really, uh, again, an emergence of personalized medicine and personalized health. And we'll talk about that in a second. And, and definitely companion therapeutics. If you have a certain condition or, or comorbidity, um, you're going to have a digital a digital kind of narrow intelligence kind of help you navigate uh, through that condition. Um, on the bottom, clinical, a lot of push around clinical diagnostics and clinical decision support. That gets to be a pretty complex, uh, complex data science area because, you know, we, we as individuals are different. You know, we might have some of the same basic makeups in terms of components within our physiology, but everything about us then starts to vary. So as you traverse down, really trying to figure out what's wrong with somebody, it can get a, a pretty complex decision tree uh, from that perspective. But this is where you're gonna see a lot of cooperative intelligence emerge in terms of, of um, kind of companion, companion diagnosis systems to suggest that a physician may look at thing or to see kind of uh, correlations between uh, uh, certain medications and uh, treatment factors and how what would may be unrelated medications are actually being positive, having a positive impact. Um, last of robotics, um, see robotics in the operating rooms uh, today. Uh, and it's, it helps overall with kind of recovery, uh, less impact on, on our bodies when we're able to do things uh, from a micro perspective. And even, even what you're gonna see, I think in this dimension, is ability, you know, for us to ingest things that are smart and intelligence that can help um, help a physician navigate our condition. Um, and then finally, operations. A lot of work around fraud detection, particularly on the payer space. Uh, operational optimization, you know, we've done a lot of work in, in AI around revenue cycle management in terms of uh, figuring out patterns within rev cycle, both from a provider and a payer side of life. Uh, training is a big one, you know. Uh, you know, virtual virtualization and a whole, all this virtual reality is really going to help accelerate training and efficiencies um, across the board. Uh, scenario planning, you know, we're kind of seeing this um, come true with some of the previous scenario plannings with pandemics. Uh, actually, uh, we're pretty close to mirroring what trend transpired uh, with COVID. Uh, so scenario planning with disaster recovery and such is, is, a, big, is a big issue here. And, and last but not least, where we like it or not, marketing in terms of how, how we get this kind of mass marketing coupled with these, this micro-targeting to us as individuals. Um, and last, last uh, we're kind of excited about this one, Merce, because we've been We've been doing a lot of research uh, with some partners around the whole aspect of ambient and ambient technologies. And ambient's another discipline within artificial intelligence that takes a physical thing and represents it in, in cyberspace or virtually. Um, a lot of work initially around IoT devices and, and creating a virtual representation of an IoT device, uh, but even more energy really kind of pushing down this path of creating an ambient twin or a AI representation of yourself that's able to go out and do things on your behalf um, and, and 
also interact with you in a very constructive way uh, for your own health and well-being. Um, so kind of love the love this dimension. Uh, it's both exciting and can be a uh, can be a bit scary. Um, but we see a lot of possibilities here uh, if we're able to address some of the broader ethical consideration around our artificial intelligence. Uh, which leads me kind of to the last point. Um, <clears throat> challenges, uh, challenges and potential. So on the potential side, uh, and you know, PwC has a great quote in one of their studies that artificial intelligence can add about 15.7 trillion to the world economy by 2030. That's not people buying artificial intelligence. That's the impact on the world economy. That's a huge, huge number. Uh, I actually think it can be, uh, be higher than that, depending on the rate of adoption. Um, underneath, you'll see the market size for AI and AI solutions in that spectrum we talked about um, grow from 22 billion in 2020 to 126 billion in 2025. Uh, that's a big market junk. That's a pretty high growth rate. Tells you there's lots of investment and lot, lots of research going into this space. But again, fundamental to making all this work is still resides at the data level, getting data in context, getting data ready, and actually making data smart so you can have smarter AI. Um, and that's that's where we spend a lot of our time. It's a huge problem, should not be trivialized, um, and really kind of a necessary uh, stepping stone into in terms of one of the problems that have to be overcome. The second is computing. Um, again, Moore's laws and with you know some of these early indications in quantum computing, uh, we're going to have more and more power just in our hands and, and collectively how these things really work together, how the devices that we carry around along with um, along with some of the broader uh, broader uh, high high capacity computational environments. Uh, we're going to see computing begin to catch up with where the where the research and where the theories are in, in artificial intelligence. Um, we hit context and trust. It's pretty important for data, you know, um, because. Data is growing so rapidly. You know, one of the premises in AI is that we we actually had data scarcity. You know, that we didn't have enough data, and I actually think that's past that tipping point to where it's more of a data abundance um, environment. You know, more more data about you, more data about the environments, more data um, about the world around us uh, really can be uh, over daunting. Without context and trust, uh, it becomes too too big and too large. Um, and unmanageable. Uh, the human factor. The human factor really has kind of multiple dimensions to the human factor. You know, what do we do with all these people when AI begins to do tasks better than humans? Um, and uh, where 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 do they find their value and their value placed in the world uh, when AI takes over some of the mundane physical tasking um, that uh, a lot of humans and skilled skill taskings. Uh, that we're pretty good at. Um, so we have to deal with that. We have to deal with this notion, as I mentioned, that AI is going to provide a lot of um, a lot of value into the economy. Um, how is that? How is that distributed? Is it just to a small handful full of owners uh, who started a particular uh, AI? Or are we going to be able to lift up the broader um, the broad, our broader communities and individuals, regardless of current social economic status? I think that's a that's a huge ethical consideration. Um, and last is kind of the human interface. Uh, we already see ourselves being manipulated online and actually these techniques to get us addicted uh, to games, to some of the online social media platforms. And AI is just going to make that a whole lot um, a whole lot better in terms of how they engage you as a person um, and, and kind of that addictive, addictive factor. So we have to be cognizant of that fact and, and deal with that from a, from a broader perspective. Um, you know, legal, lots of aspect of legal. Um, one is what happens when AI, AI makes mistakes and it may cost a human life? Uh, who's legally responsible? Who, where the legal ownership uh, resides of an AI as they start to transition past the singularity? Who owns that? Who owns that? And, and should we start considering that a particular AI has uh, a set of rights uh, associated with that? Uh, so lots of lots of legal dimensions to the problem. Um, learning and bias. This is a big one. We talk about this and we've seen some experiments out in the market where, for instance, like Microsoft got loose an AI, um, an AI bot to be trained um, in the wild. And we saw what happened to that went sideways pretty quickly. Um, the fact is humans create AI, humans that interact with AI have biases. 
Um, if machines are learning either in a structured or unstructured way, uh, they're going to create their own biases. So how do you how do you throttle bias? How do you reinforce good AI, AI behavior versus bad AI, AI behavior? Um, particularly if somebody's really trying to deploy it from a from a negative con connotation or a bad perspective. Um, last is privacy and security. Uh, kind of big uh, a big factor here. Are we really creating um, this true kind of uh, uh, this big brother kind of environment, the surveillance state that we we all are concerned about. Somebody that can recognize who we are as we're walking down the street, kind of track track our movements, track what we're doing online and offline, um, and really build a persona of us that we we may not believe is an accurate persona of us. So that that's pretty important, as well as some of the security dimensions. Deep fake deep fakes has been in the news quite often, and it's getting harder and harder to detect. Uh, what those are. So again, another big uh, security concern. Um, and I mentioned this before, but I want to hit it again, which is moral agents and robot rights. So moral agents are the ambient twin I talked about. Um, and and do I have rights in cyberspace as related to my ambient twin? Do my rights extend to to that twin? Uh, and same if if I have really a physical presence, say a robot, do, do my rights extend to that? Again, uh, something that we need to really talk about. Um, and the last and the big one, should AI be allowed to take a human life uh, by design? And so we know a lot of advances are coming from a military uh, point of view um, and even a broader uh, uh, homeland security, physical uh, security perspective. Uh, so how far do we want AI to go? And in coupled with this notion of AI makes mistakes or comes to faulty conclusions, you know, we saw some of this in, in a very old movie called War Games, but for instance, if we say AI help us help us solve the cancer problem, and it comes to the conclusion that uh, cancer can be solved by eliminating humans, um, that's not a very good conclusion. And nor do we want that AI to be able to act upon that premise. Um, so I think we're getting to the point of kind of the last and concluding statements, and we're going to just have a couple question and answer dialogue. Um, you know, Stephen Hawking, uh, I think, had a great quote that AI could be either the best thing or the worst things that happen to humanity. You know, we've seen Elon Musk talk talk about, you know, when we when we really cut AI loose, we're releasing the demons. But yet he's working on putting a chip uh, implant in somebody's brain to augment a human being. Um, again, it's it's again this broader ethical dilemma by uh, augmentation of AI and robotics and other things. When is a human not a human, or when does a machine become human? These are these are very broad questions that are really being kicked around at lots of levels, both from a scientific perspective, uh, from a legal perspective, and definitely from a moral and spiritual perspective. Um, and that kind of wraps up the the slide where for today. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to get out of here and stop stop sharing my screen uh, just for a moment. Um, bring Tyson back in and, and see if we can kick around a couple questions before we close out. Uh, and if you anybody has any uh, questions, please stick them in the chat and we'll we'll be happy to address them. <clears throat> so Tyson, you mentioned something earlier I want to throw back at throw back at you, which is yeah. kind of your first experience with AI and machine learning. Um, talk a little bit more about that and what you actually learned from that experience and, and what you brought forward. Sure. Um, but, uh, before I jump into that, I, I got to tell you, war games was one of my favorite movies at the Whopper. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you awesome. brought you, you gave me flashbacks. Okay. So, um, about, uh, it's about eight years ago now. Um, I was presented with a challenge, uh, from a, a CTO. Uh, he's a pretty nice guy, but at a previous company, uh, Frank said, Hey, we have this wealth of information. And it was around claim information. And it was like, we have to figure out from a tactical perspective, how do we go out and attack different claims for uh, reprocessing things that had errors in them, things that had a dollar amounts tied to them uh, that were going to cost either the hospital or a provider or even the patient lots and lots of money. But there were tens of thousands of these claims and there was no way to go through it. Uh, person, you know, have a person go through them one at a time and evaluate each one. So we said, well, I, I think we've just found our first use case for machine learning. And so um, Frank said, well, go disappear for a while and go figure this out and get back to me. 
And so uh, that was my first dive. And it was not just a trivial dive, but it was a headlong dive right into a, a very complicated use case. But it was fun because what it did was put a real world spin on, there is a real world problem here that we have to solve for claims information that we don't have a solution for. We could hire hundreds of people to go through these one at a time and it would still take a year to go through them all. And there was just no way to do it. And so it was my first Fourier into this. Um, I tried classification models. I tried regression models. What I learned really quickly is data is dirty. And as soon as you try to present training information to the model, <laughs> What's that? <laughs> That's a true statement. Data is dirty, particularly in healthcare. Is, especially in healthcare. Uh, we used to have a saying that, or we still do, that data is both sparse and dirty. And when you have that kind of data, it's really hard to get a machine taught properly on how to evaluate the next set of data it sees. So part of it was coming up with a large enough quantifiable data set in order to get the machine learning trained properly. But once it was done, we had about an 80% success rate of identifying which claims needed a human to go look at it in more detail. So out of the 10,000 claims, we could run them through in a couple hours and have an output that said, okay, here is the set that we really need a person to go through, and this set can be handled separately. And it was that first um, uh, use case that really opened up my eyes to what AI could really do and machine learning can do. And, uh, you know, that was prior to graph databases. That was right as graph databases were trying to get a foothold in things. And now years later, seeing where the marriage of graph databases and machine learning come into play, um, it, it's just more exciting on the more it can unlock uh, the future of it all. So. Okay. I got another one for you. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Jeez. Um, I'm going I'm to keep throwing them out here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and I, I know we only have a few minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this the last question. Um, I mean, you talked a lot about uh, graph models and databases. And, you know, one of our mm -hmm. core technologies is this thing called this thing called LifeGraph. So explain explain just at a high level the difference between what is a personal life graph and kind of the broader the back end um, back end learning engine that really creates a lot of these associations and and why it's important to distinct the two kinds of graphs. So um, you know life graph is what we use to, to describe how I as a person relate to everything around me, and I have my own personal life graph but I have a connection to other life graphs and those life graphs have connections to other life graphs. And as you can see, this evolves from and spreads out very exponentially. And what we have to be able to do behind the scenes in Burst IQ is understand all of those relationships. And that's the part of machine learning that we have to use to start identifying how did this um, occur? And so um, let me give you an example. So let's say we have a surgical event where um, a doctor used a particular supply. And now all of a sudden we have to understand what are the people that touched the operating room? What are the nurses that were involved with that supply? What are the patients that were involved in the supply? What is the cost of infection that could have occurred from a bad uh, supply lot? And so all of that, you could query it through a relational database and get there, but a life graph adds context of when, where, who, how, and then by performing these kinds of queries in machine learning, we can explore and find relationships in that data that we wouldn't have seen particularly well with a, a traditional database setup. So um, how we apply machine learning to LifeGraph to answer questions today is a lot different than what we would have done five, seven, eight years ago. And I, um, you know, I'm pretty, I'm actually pretty excited at this point in time because um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up and I'm gonna tell you why I'm excited. <laughs> uh, because, because the next, um, the next round, um, and I'm, uh, the next round, we're going to talk about how we're applying all, all these things, you know, from the standpoint of, um, you know, machine learning and graph modeling and building these really amazing structures called life graphs and applying them to really driving the next generation of health and health engagement. You know, what we'd like to say is that we create smart data um, and give you insights and the ability to engage with all the people, places, and things that drive your business. So smart data coupled with machine intelligence, we think is really kind of the future foundation for the data dimension of healthcare. Um, and uh, next, next webinar, uh, we're gonna talk about this whole 
aspect of the health singularity. It's one of the it was one of the fundamental premises that we had when we launched Burst IQ that there was going to be this convergence of data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, and smart products. These next generations of smart devices. Uh, that are going to usher in a whole new engagement model within health and health care, not just not just um, not just health care. Uh, so pretty excited about what's coming up in the next uh, next knowledge burst. Uh, really, um, really happy that uh, you all joined us today. Uh, thank you so much for absolutely. This. And thanks, uh, everyone. Look forward to seeing you next one. And Tyson, thanks for the education today. I I learned something again. Every time we talk, I learned something new. Um, awesome. Y'all have a great day. Y'all take care now. Thanks.